Hi, believe it or not, but I found another 10 little known DOS games. So, let's check them out. I've never played Wraith. In fact, I've never even heard of it or anyone else mention it even in passing. Nothing. Until today, that is. And since it's an RPG, I'm a bit surprised as it's my favorite genre and I should have at the very least a passing knowledge of it. Sure, it's not that important today, but it is, at least to me, unexpected. A beautiful mermaid queen and a young man have been in love for a while. They've spent every moment they could together and their lives were filled with laughter, love, passion and tons upon tons of delicious exotic cuisines they've enjoyed discovering together. I mean, I've no proof at all of that last one, but it seemed appropriate. Their idle life, however, did not last that long, as an evil and obviously jealous of their love sorcerer ruined their lives. Today, years later, a wraith looking eerily like the mermaid queen from the past approached our hero who woke up in an unknown dungeon, oblivious to where he was and how he got there. I should not really be married to that whole he pronoun, as you can choose to play as a woman at the game start, but whatever. For the sake of the story, let's assume you've picked a man. And she, the mermaid that is, kept addressing him as if he was her lover seemingly unaware of her ghostly state and his entirely physical and quite alive form. Her voice and talking kept enchanting a young man, leading him, charmed by it, followed her deeper and deeper into the dungeon. I don't know of any mermaids, so I can't vouch for how effective their seductions are, but I know one vamp mate, half vampire, half mermaid, and her voice is real dangerous. Scary stuff, folks, trust me. Wraith is played from a top-down perspective, not unlike the one seen in the late Ultima games, and runs in real time for both, exploration and combat, which itself is a rather simple fare of right-click mashing on the enemy till he dies, or you tire out, whichever comes first. The story unfolds as you progress through the game getting deeper into the dungeon and is rather decent. It's not on the level of the aforementioned Ultima, not even close, but if you keep in mind that Wraith has been made by one person, it's definitely noteworthy. Oh, and like I've mentioned earlier, you can pick a gender of your character and a class too, choosing between fighter, druid, ranger or a paladin. While Wraith is neither the biggest nor the best RPG out there, it's definitely worth a look, especially that not often a single person effort ends up being such a complete and playable title. Wrecking Crew is one or two player kart racer. And yes, I am aware that there are no cards in it, but please, let me explain. Imagine Mario Kart. With all that it entails, so cartoon-like vehicles, funky and Nintendo-centric cast of cute characters and tons upon tons of pickups to find the news to beat your opponents on the way to the finish line. You're still with me? Great. I never doubted the power of your imagination. So, let's start replacing things. First to drop are the characters and their cars. So the Princess Peaches, Mario's, Goobas, Luigi's and the whole Nintendo shebang have to go bye-bye. Instead, we get a cast of weird, bizarre and odd characters you've not dreamed of. A two-headed Siamese twins joined by a single body, Frankenstein out of spare body parts creature from the nightmares, old woman, circus trainer, Rasta and many many more. We're done with that, so let's swap away the pickups and power-ups now. While many are similar to those of Mario Kart, even if different named and looking, few are entirely unique to the Wrecking Crew. I mean, for instance, stars that better your handling, especially on those sharp corners, repair that fixes damage done to your vehicle, teleport that instantly moves you ahead on the track, time stop that holds your opponents for a few seconds, X2, which doubles the damage dealt with your weapons, keys, when all four are collected, they unlock access to a secret hidden race. And since I've already mentioned weapons, you can fire left, right, backwards and in all directions with specials. So learning how to best utilize those and which to use when, and also how all power-ups work, is a key for success. Wrecking Crew is not the easiest of games when you play it first and may require you to learn it. But as soon as you do and start learning about shortcuts, secret routes and hidden areas, you'll begin winning and eventually will master all of them and then conquer numerous caps. Wrecking Crew is an incredibly fun title if you're a fan of the whole crazy arcade karting experience and especially if you have a friend with you to race against. Enjoyed like that, it can no doubt provide hours of fun. There are two areas it could improve in though. First would be full real online multiplayer with more than just two players racing, as while it's fun the way it is, just imagine how much more it would be. And second is the rubber banding, which I hate with the passion of a competitive sausage eater, so angrily and with permanent craving for more. Wins, more wins obviously. When I'm ahead, I wanna stay ahead, and when I'm behind, I wanna fight for the position. Difficulty slider is always a better choice than rubber banding. Wrecking Crew is a unique and fun take on kart racers, so if you enjoy this, don't sleep on it.
Zargon is a 2D side-scrolling action platformer with a touch of mystery in its story. You play as Molvinus Haversin, an archaeologist and a proud owner of the name that's an absolute nightmare for me to pronounce. So I will call him Molvin from now on. So, Molvin's studying ancient mystical ruins in the Madagascar. They appear to be of completely foreign to what we're familiar with origin and made by the ancient civilization known only as the Blue Builders. And I don't wanna guess here, but if I was to, I'd say that they just had to be the Smurfs. They just gotta be. While he attempts to decipher glyphs covering the structure, a weird gas is suddenly emitted and Molvin loses consciousness. While asleep, he is warned by the upcoming dangers by Silvertongue, a talking eagle. As cryptic as it may sound, he takes it to heart, because who wouldn't believe a talking eagle if they met one? So when he awakens, in a strange, alien and dangerous world, he is ready. Surprised as hell and tad dizzy, but ready nonetheless. With Silvertongue's help, Molvin will have to travel through the land, fighting with anything and everything on his way, to eventually face and defeat the evil overlord, Zargon. You're initially armed with a laser gun, which is not a lot, especially that only one projectile can be on the screen at once, meaning each of your shots have to be aimed carefully. But quite fortunately, you discover that you can sort of bend the trajectory of the shot a little, the way they did in Wanted. Older sci-fi flick with Angelina Jolie when she was still playing in fun action-packed movies. So there's that at least. As you progress through the unknown lands, you'll be able to pick up upgrades like rapid fire, fireball ammo, more bullets at the screen at once, or rocks, which are surprisingly good weapon actually. Other than that, you can also collect fruits, epic pool balls, beating hearts and emeralds. Each 16 fruit can be exchanged for one of your 5 bars of health, epic pool balls provide points, more of them if they're picked up in an order, beating hearts restore your health in full, and emeralds can be exchanged for power-ups, health and weapon upgrades. The enemies are varied and interesting, the levels are nice, lush and fun to platform through. It's all great, is what I'm saying. Originally, Zargon released a Sharer split into 3 episodes, first of which was available for free. But since 2008, the entire game is given away as freeware, so unless you're really not a fan of the genre, there's no reason not to try it out. Explosive with an X and not E is another of those previously paid Sharer games that are now entirely free. Also, a lot of fun in multiplayer. So, win-win? It's a take on the classic Bomberman formula, with all four players playing as rabbits instead of bombers. Other than that, the differences are minus cool. So, you can still run around the maze that's built out of both destructible and indestructible blocks and had to get rid of all the enemies to quote-unquote win the stage. You do so by placing bombs, which explode after a couple of seconds delay. Some of the blocks reveal power-ups when destroyed, and these two are generally speaking what you expect from the clone. So explosion blast radius increase, number of available bombs, movement speed increase and others. There's two game modes included, dual game and level game, which I have to say are the absolute cream of the crop in naming and a sign of true and unprecedented creativity. First is your typical free-for-all between four players on randomly generated stages and all slots not filled by humans are controlled by the CPU. The second is kind of a campaign in which you go through a series of predefined preset levels with an objective of clearing them from all the monsters. This mode can be played alone or in two-player co-op, which is a nice touch as it was not a norm. Explosive suffers from the same issue other Bomberman clones do, meaning that it's amazing and hella fun in multiplayer, but alone in single player it quickly gets repetitive and the feeling of boredom sets in fast. It's fine I suppose, as it was never designed as an experience to be had alone, but it's worth keeping in mind. On the plus side, Explosive comes with the level editor, which extends its life and stay considerably. Wrath of Earth is a futuristic sci-fi FPS and one of the most obscure games in its genre. Not only I've never played it before working on this video, but I've also not even heard or read about it. Not a single word, nothing, which is rather unusual. Anyway, something terrible has happened in the Argon mining colony on the planet Thermadax. Most of the colonists have been killed, mining robots and automated defenses are running rampant shooting at anything they can aim at, and what's more, all signs point to a potential alien invasion. To deal with the situation, a hero is sent to investigate. A strong, smart and capable one. Also one with impeccable taste in music, but that's less important in a mission like this one. I think it's obvious that I meant you, right? I mean, I'm talking to you, so it was clear that there were no other, but by saying it aloud, I also legitimized it. So now, you've no other way than go ahead and save us. Anyway, you're given an exoskeleton armed with numerous weapons and are sent to deal with the situation and figure out what happened. 
The available weapons are stronger and weaker, each suiting best in different situations. Some of them require separate ammo, while others use your suit's power. Interestingly enough, your suit can recharge its power and repair itself using energy from any light source. So, if you ever find one and are not being actively fired upon, it's good to take a breather and recharge. While most areas that you'll visit are neutral, some are under the effect of extreme temperature or radioactivity. And these affect both, you and your weaponry too. There's obviously quite a lot of simple but omnipresent environmental puzzling mainly focusing on opening doors and conversations with few remaining survivors. They're not difficult and serve more as a background to the shooting than anything serious. While Wrath of Earth is not the most technologically advanced or best looking FPS out there, it's decent looking and plays pretty well, serving a ok story to boot. Oh, and it also has quite a few features many of the games in the genre at the time did not have. So, infrared headlights, auto lock on targets, ability to identify objects with the crosshair, strafing, yup, believe it or not, but it was not a given in FPSs at the time, and most importantly, it has something nearly no games do. You, controlling the exoskeleton and investigating happenings in the colony by means of generous spread of bullets going towards anything that's not stationary. Towards some stationary things for that matter too. Have you ever played Fury of the Fairies? Amazing game, right? All four of the colorful Furies, each with a different skill set, going through increasingly more difficult and ultra fun puzzle platforming stages and redefining the genre for the generations to come. Yep, I loved it too. And you know what? It has nothing to do with our today's game. Well, other than its protagonist looking like one of those Furies. But other than that, nothing. I mean, you saw the title screen, I'm sure you agree. Anyway, Xenoball is a puzzler too. Not a platformer though. And it has a story. You're Zin Obol, like O'Brien but Obol, and have to save Princess Urbana from the clutches of evil Gorgozola, who's one letter short of being a tasty cheese. Why did he to her though? Nobody knows, and frankly nobody should care either. What's important is the gameplay, and it's quite demanding but also fantastic. It's a mixture of Pipe Mania and Lemmings, so unlike anything else you've seen. The gameplay is all about our protagonist leaving the start of point and having to get to the exit unscathed. All the while moving across the railing, falling off of which kills you. There's no way of directly controlling Zen, and instead you can add railing tiles to the track he moves on. Each of the elements either fill in the gaps or add special functionalities to it that can be used to control either our hero's traversal path or other objects attached to the railings, like fans for instance. Even if it's not obvious how all these tiles work at the first play, at least judging by how they look, they're introduced gradually and you get plenty enough time to familiarize yourself with them and by extension of that, game's inner mechanics. As you progress through the Xeno Ball, you'll notice that some of the tiles often fall off the railings, sometimes straight after our hero goes over them. And believe you me, there's some strategy behind it too, cause quite often you'll need to utilize the same spot to use different tiles at different times, to have complete control of the stage and Zin's movement. I know how that sounds, I really do, you don't have to tell me, and it probably makes close to no sense to you, explained like that at the very least. But if you like arcade puzzlers and give Xenoball literally 5 minutes, you'll fall in love with it and will have a lot of fun after. Zaytax is a shareware futuristic horizontally scrolling shoot em up. It takes place in the 25th century when, as per usual, and as you no doubt expected already, aliens known only as Zatax attacked humanity. Fortunately by then we're spread a bit more in the galaxy and not just relegated to a single planet, which gives us a bit more time to react, prepare and counter attack. I'm not sure how much time we actually need to be ready, other than to call you, but given the vastness of space you getting to us may take a while, and that's exactly as much time as we need. So, as we were eagerly awaiting your arrival, biting our nails, nervously packing, drinking to forget and getting ready for the wars, aliens have been steadily progressing, capturing and draining our planets one by one, consuming the life force of their inhabitants, getting stronger after each and every victory. Why didn't we send the army, our fleet or space commandos against them you may wonder? Well, according to the game's lore, centuries of peace and prosperity made us forget about the warfare and we neither manufactured nor used weapons anymore, which is at the very least weird. As last time I checked, humans were capable of forgetting about many things, like humanitarian rights, peace, borders, their own kids or freedoms, but not weapons. Never weapons. We seem to always be laser focused on manufacturing, researching and developing more, better, faster and stronger weapons. Sometimes all at once. 
the arms race of our kind never really ends. Still, in the game we're left with nothing, so the entire defensive is relegated to badly coordinated and failing on all fronts evacuations. Enter you, the last Star Warrior, the only one capable of stopping the alien on slow. Also, the only one able to pilot the last ancient and rust-covered starfighter. Let the fact that it's been taken out of the Museum of Ancient History speak to its overall quality and firepower. That said, it's nearly never about gear and most of the time all about who makes it work and it's you. And you will do just that, go through numerous rather interestingly designed levels freeing the known universe of the alien scum one planet at the time. Zaytax is divided into three worlds of numerous levels each and they're filled to the brim with uniquely looking bodies. They are both active and stationary and a lot of fun to dispose of. Destroyed enemies drop pickups from time to time and these can offer upgrades or grant access to new weapons. While Zaytax is not spectacular at anything, it does everything you'd expect from the shooter well, making for a very enjoyable, even if a bit on a difficult side experience. So, if you like shmups, it's definitely one not to miss, even if it's not gonna shatter your world or redefine understanding of the genre. Wingstar is a vertically scrolling shooter. And guess what? No aliens. Well, at least none invading us. Cause we're kind of bad guys in this one. Well, not we we, more like you you, cause you're not only a criminal sentenced for crimes against the Empire, but also sent on the front lines to conquer new planets for the ever hungry behemoth that the Empire has become over the years of conquests. To be fair, you were obviously imprisoned based on an unfair sentence, cause I know you, and you're definitely not a bad person. You were also given a choice of going into the fight or staying behind the bars forever. And let me tell you, those space prisons are no joke. They're full of space rats, space cockroaches and space food. Or more accurately, space prison food. Which is another little nightmare never to be mentioned. So yeah, you did chose to fight, but only cause staying behind would have ended up being an even bigger challenge. I wouldn't say that you chose the lesser evil, as you're you, so you will most likely eradicate entire civilizations without fail, making it an ultimate evil, but it's definitely a less uncomfortable choice, even if mentally devastating. Wingstar gives you a choice of two different ships to fly, five difficulty levels and a very decent presentation, both in terms of sound design and graphics. And since we're on the subject, it not only features many layers, but also serves a very decent looking semi-3D effect with some of the taller structures that you're flying over. For the most part, there's not much special about Wingstar, it does everything you'd look for in a shooter, so hundreds if not thousands of big and small enemies, various pickups, big and bad bosses, well, that bad bit is questionable as it's you doing the invading, and it adds over 50 weapons to it all, for a very fun and enjoyable experience. Wolfsbane is a side-view action-adventure title, placing you in an uncomfortable shoes of a merchant named Alex. One day, while traveling from point A to point B, you know, as merchants did to peddle their questionable wares and remedies for non-existent conditions, like bloaty head syndrome, excessive hair growth, rotten in aura disease, or smelly gases illness, he is jumped by a particularly nasty creature and beaten. Now, I was not completely honest with you, naturally, points A and B had names, there were towns in fact, and the creature was not only nasty, but also a werewolf. Which sucks, big time. But since you survived this near-death experience, you've much bigger issues to deal with now. Unless you remove the bite-induced curse, you will transform into werewolf yourself, and no later than this coming midnight. If you don't manage to deal with it in time, and it happens even once, you'll be a werewolf forever. While the situation is less than optimal, you're used to dealing with seemingly impossible and don't lose neither hope nor will to save yourself. And since the attack happened near a town, you've put one and one together and came up with feasible plan. To remove the curse, you need to find whomever beat you and he's bound to be in the town. So, you set off on a quest to find your attacker and save yourself. While entirely side-scrolling like some of the early action games were, Wolfsbane for the most part plays like a typical adventure game with all the obligatory examinations of surroundings and items found in them, talking to numerous characters, finding and using items and solving puzzles. So, most of the time you'll be looking for the clues peacefully with an occasional arcade combat here and there. Now, not only these combat sequences are clunky as hell, but also happen seemingly for no reason, at least I can't tell of any. You walk into the area and suddenly dude comes at you with a stick waving it like a lunatic. 
Fortunately, you can usually just pass the attacker by, ignoring him and his stupid ass sword, moving to the neighboring screen. And get this, it's as if nothing ever happened, as they seem to have never possessed the skill of passing the screen borders. Wolfsbane was an interesting idea and looks quite good too, but is heavily let down by a rather flat and uninspired story, mundane puzzles and irritating combat. Unless you're a hardcore adventure player, you'll do best avoiding this one, as it's not great. Xenocide is like genocide, but performed on outer space creatures. So, it doesn't count, right? Oof, I was worried there for a second that we'd had a moral dilemma on our heads. But since it's Xeno and not Gino, we're all good. No, no we're not. We're never fine with anything that ends with sight. Note that down. That said, the situation on our hands is a bit unique here. Cause as per usual, short of that little exception we've spoke about today earlier, it's the aliens that attacked us. And it's us who's the Xeno to them in this scenario, and not vice versa. So, we're in fact on the defensive here. Fortunately, they focused their initial attacks on moons of our planet Talos 4, and that's where you'll need to face them. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though, as it appears that these satellites of ours cannot be cleared like that willy-nilly and have to be destroyed. What are the potential consequences of such actions on the planet itself, especially on the waters and the weather, is beyond our wildest guesses now, but if we're not gonna stop the invaders, we'll never live long enough to learn it. So, you being the universal superhero, the space rumble and interplanetary commando rolled into one, are sent to do the dirty nasty deed. Each of the moons that you'll fight on is built out of four entirely differently looking and playing levels that all have to be completed to destroy them. In first, you're always flying over the moon's surface in first-person semi-3D view, seeking the cave entrance. You're also shooting all the enemies here, or more often than not actually, have them splatter on your windshield like some kind of space mosquitoes, given how finicky the controls are. In second, you're exploring the set cave inside view looking for fire bombs. You have a laser shot and grenades at this stage, and trust me, you'll need them. In third, somehow, nobody knows how and why, you're underwater and also side scrolling, looking for keys and minding your oxygen levels. If I had to guess, I'd say that it was included to add variety, though having it be near identical to the one before is hardly creative. And in the fourth and final, you're playing in a top-down grid-based maze shooter, disposing of the omnipresent and ever attacking enemies, planting bombs near the nuclear reactors and then running away before they explode by teleporters. Xenocide may not be the best action arcade shooter out there, but mixing genres and viewpoints over its three included moons made for a more interesting and enjoyable game than it would have been otherwise. And while it's not something you'll be replaying time after time, it's a good game to jump into once every few years or so. Holy more those games filled episode, Batman! How did you like them? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.